Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining the latest uh, coronavirus press conference. Yesterday afternoon, I was briefed on the latest data that shows the virus spreading uh, more rapidly in London, the southeast and the east of England than would be expected, given the tough restrictions that are already in place. And I also received an explanation for why the virus is spreading more rapidly in these areas. It seems that the spread is now being driven by the new variant of the virus, which uh, we spoke about earlier this week and learned about earlier this week. Our advisory group on new and emerging respiratory virus threats, NERVTAG, has spent the last few days analysing this new variant. There's no evidence that it causes more severe illness or higher mortality, but it does appear to be passed on significantly more easily. Nerve tag's early analysis suggests the new variant could increase the R by 0.4 or more, and although there's considerable uncertainty, it may be up to 70% more transmissible than the old variant, the original version of the disease. This is early data, and it's subject to review, but it's the best that we have at the moment, and we have to act on information as we have it, because this is now spreading very fast. The UK has by far the best genomic sequencing ability in the world, which means we're better able to identify new strains like this than any other country. The Chief Medical Officer last night submitted our findings so far to the World Health Organization, and we'll continue to be totally transparent with our global partners. There's still much that we don't know. While we're fairly certain the variant is transmitted more quickly, there's no evidence to suggest it is more lethal or causes more severe illness. Equally, there's no evidence to suggest the vaccine will be any less effective against uh, the new variant. Our experts will continue their work to improve our understanding as fast as we can. So we're learning about it as we go, but we already know uh, enough, more than enough, to be sure that we must act now. So I met ministers on the COVID operations committee last night, and again first thing this morning, cabinet met at lunchtime to agree the following actions. First, we will introduce new restrictions in the most affected areas, specifically those parts of London, the southeast and the east of England, which are currently in tier three. These areas will enter a new Tier 4, which will be broadly equivalent to the national restrictions which were in place in England in November. That means residents in those areas must stay at home, apart from limited exemptions set out in law. Non-essential retail, indoor gyms and leisure facilities and personal care services must close. People must work from home if they can, but may travel to work if this is not possible, for example, in the construction and manufacturing sectors. People should not enter or leave Tier 4 areas, and Tier 4 residents must not stay overnight away from home. Individuals can only meet one person from another household in an outdoor public space. Unlike the November national restrictions, communal worship can continue to take place in Tier 4 areas, and these measures will take effect from tomorrow morning. All tiers will continue to be regularly reviewed in line with the approach previously set out, with the next formal review taking place on the 30th of December. Second, we're issuing new advice on travel. Although the new variant is concentrated in tier four areas, it is nonetheless present at lower levels around the country. So we're asking everyone in all tiers to stay local. People should carefully consider whether they need to travel abroad and they should follow the rules in their tier. Those in tier four areas will not be permitted to travel abroad apart from limited exceptions such as for work purposes. Third, we must, I'm afraid, look again at Christmas. And as Prime Minister, it's my duty to take difficult decisions to do what is right to protect the people of this country. Given the early evidence we have on this 
new variant of the virus, the potential risk it poses, uh, it is with a very heavy heart, I must tell you, we cannot continue with Christmas as planned. In England, those living in Tier 4 areas should not mix with anyone outside their own household at Christmas, though support bubbles will remain in place for those at particular risk of loneliness or isolation. Across the rest of the country, the Christmas rules allowing up to three households to meet will now be limited to Christmas Day only, rather than the five days as previously set out. As before, there will be no relaxation on the 31st of January, so people must not break the rules at New Year. They must, they must not break the rules at New Year. It's very, very important to, to emphasise that. I know how much emotion people invest in this time of year and how important it is, for instance, for grandparents to see their grandchildren, for families to be together. So I know how disappointing this will be. But we have said throughout this pandemic that we must and we will be guided by the science. When the science changes, we must change our response. And when the virus changes its method of attack, we must change our method of defence. And as your Prime Minister, I sincerely believe there is no alternative open to me. Without action, the evidence suggests that infections would soar, hospitals would become overwhelmed, and many thousands more would lose their lives. And I want to stress that we are not alone in this fight or in taking these types of decisions. Many of our European friends and neighbours are being forced to take similar action. We're working closely with the devolved administrations to protect people in every part of the UK. And of course, there is now real, real hope that we will soon be rid of this virus. And that prospect is growing with every day that passes and every vaccine dose that is administered. As you know, the UK was the first country in the Western world to start using a clinically approved vaccine. And so, please, if the NHS contacts you, then get your vaccine and join the 350,000 people across the UK who have already had their first dose. Yes, Christmas this year will be different, very different, but we must be realistic. We're sacrificing the chance to see our loved ones this Christmas so we have a better chance of protecting their lives so that we can see them at future Christmases. And as sure as night follows day, uh, we'll beat back this virus, we'll defeat it and reclaim our lives. But I'm going to hand over now to Patrick, who is going to go through some of the slides explaining this decision. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister. May I have the first slide, please? This slide is the Office for National Statistics uh, slide showing infections have risen again in recent weeks. So it shows the percentage of positive tests against time, and you can see from July to September it was fairly flat. An increase occurred during September up to a peak, after which the lockdown led to a decrease in the numbers during November, and it is now on the increase again. So the lockdown brought the numbers down, and now we are seeing them rising again. Next slide, please. This shows the levels on the 29th of November up to the 13th of December. So on the left-hand side is the average uh, cases in, in, in the last two weeks from the, in November the 29th, and on the right-hand side is in mid-December. The darker the colour, the higher the number of cases. And what you can see is, first of all, that there are some areas that have got very dark, and here it's South Wales and in the southeast of England, and that the overall cases have increased by more than 50%. So a substantial increase in numbers over the period of December. If I just concentrate now on the southeast, east and, and, and London, 
we'll see a picture which I think begins to link into the new virus variant. Next slide, please. So this is hospital admissions per day in London, the east of England and the southeast from NHS data from September through to now. You can see a gradual increase in the number of hospital admissions per day and you can see a very sharp increase during December. This virus has taken off, it's moving fast and it's leading inevitably to a sharp increase in hospital admissions. Next slide, please. If we now look just at the areas that are moving into Tier 4, as the Prime Minister has just said, which is areas in London, the South East and the East, and look at the number of cases, the case rate against time, what you can see is that the number of cases increase or the case rate increases dramatically. If you look at the dotted line, that's for England as a whole, you can see case rate increasing to November, decreasing during lockdown and increasing again. But if you look at the solid blue line, which is London and the South East and the, and the East in Tier 4, you can see a rapid increase, a very sharp increase in rates uh, uh, over the period of December. So we have a particularly fast-moving problem with increased numbers in the area going to Tier 4, but a generalised increase across the country. Next slide, please. I'd like to just spend a moment talking about the new variant. So the new variant, and viruses mutate all the time, but the new variant contains 23 different changes, many of them associated with changes in the protein that the virus makes. This is an unusually large number of variants. It's also got variants in areas of the virus that are known to be associated with how the virus binds to cells and enters cells. So there are some changes which cause concern in terms of how the virus looks. But on top of that, there are three questions that need to be asked. Does the, does the new variant transmit more readily, i.e. does it make a, an increased chance of spread and growth? The second is, does it alter the course of the disease? Does it make people sicker? And the third is, does it alter the way that the immune system, the way the body responds to it, if it's been previously infected or following a vaccine? I want to deal with the first question. There are three different sources of evidence, from genetic studies to frequency studies to laboratory studies, all of which come together to suggest this virus has a significant, substantial increase in transmissibility. And this is also highlighted in this graph, which shows the proportion of all the cases that were due to the new variant. So the new variant was first thought to have occurred sometime in mid-September in London or Kent, and by the middle of November, about 28% or so of the cases in London and the southeast, and slightly lower in the east of England, were due to the new variant. So it had grown rapidly. By the week commencing the 9th of December, these figures were much higher. So in London, over 60% of all the cases were the new variant. So what this tells us is that this new variant not only moves fast, it is increased in terms of its ability to transmit, but it is becoming the dominant variant. It is beating all the others in terms of transmission. So this virus transmits and spreads fast. Does it alter the disease, disease course? The answer seems to be no, as far as we can tell at the moment. There's no evidence it causes a more severe disease, causes more hospitalization, causes more trouble than the other virus. So it basically looks similar. Does it alter the immune response, or is the immune response less able to recognize it? There are theoretical reasons to suspect that some of the changes might alter some of the immune responses, but there's nothing that's been seen to suggest that's the case. And our working assumption at the moment from all of the scientists is that the vaccine response should be adequate for this virus. That obviously needs to be looked at going forward, and we need to keep vigilant about this. But the big change, therefore, is not disease progress, not the immunity, but transmission. This virus spreads more easily, and therefore more measures are needed to keep it under control. We absolutely need to stick to the basics, 
of making sure that we reduce our contacts, reduce the ability for this virus to spread, and that's the reason that tougher measures are required to keep this variant under control. Thank you very much. Thanks very, very much, Patrick. Chris, is there anything you want to, to add to any of that? And well, thank you, thank you, but thank you very much then. Let's go to questions from the public and then the, and then the media. Uh, first, uh, Laura from Worthing. Why are Shielders still expected to work in Tier 3? As somebody who's already lost two loved ones to COVID, this terrifies me. Thank you. Well, Laura, um, I, I, your question, why are Shielders are still expected to work in, uh, in, in Tier 3? Uh, those who are, are shielding, those who uh, are, are vulnerable, uh, should, of course, take every step to, to protect themselves. And, uh, Laura, I hope very much that you're not asked, being asked to work if you're, uh, if, if you're shielding. If, uh, Chris, anything you want to add to that? Well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is I'm really sorry to hear about your two relatives who died from this virus. I mean, it is a very dangerous virus uh, for many people. Uh, the shielding uh, patterns are actually uh, being re-looked at, but the, the view about uh, shielding is that in the first wave, uh, Shielding did many things that were useful, but also did many things that were uh, actually actively harmful. And we have therefore changed the model uh, of, t of shielding uh, since the first wave. Uh, and uh, that includes uh, people being able to get out more in many situations uh, and also areas around work. But this is uh, something which people are keeping on looking at uh, to try and get the optimal balance between isolating people too much uh, and isolating them enough from the virus. Thanks very much. Uh, let's go to Mike from, from Cheshire. Mike from Cheshire asks, in, in the daily update figures, people testing positive, number of tests, deaths, and so forth, could you also provide uh, the number of people who've had the vaccine? Um, well, Mike, thanks for that. And uh, yes, as, as you've heard uh, from, from me just now, uh, the, the figure is th that I've been given uh, today is, is 350,000 have, have so far had their, their, first, uh, their first dose. Uh, and we'll, we'll make sure that we keep people regularly updated on the, uh, on the rollout of the vaccine. Uh, let's go to uh, Laura Koonsberg of the BBC. Um, thank you very much, Prime Minister. There were calls for you to drop the plans for Christmas last week, just a few days ago. But on Wednesday, you told me and our viewers it would be inhuman to change the plans. And now that's exactly what you've done. Aren't the millions of people whose plans have just been torn up entitled to feel that you just left this too late and you've caused them more personal disruption and upset by doing so? And can I ask the medics, you've shared some of the analysis of this new variant, but you mentioned that Port and Down have been looking at this in the earlier press conference this week. Can you say if Port and Down have completed their assessments of it? And Professor Whitty, if someone is packing a bag right now, listening to or watching this, trying to leave the southeast by midnight tonight, what should they do? Well, uh, Laura, let me first of all just say to everybody uh, who's made plans for Christmas, as I said earlier on, everybody who's thought about it, all the care and love that's gone into plans for, for Christmas, we, of course, bitterly uh, regret the, the changes that are, that are necessary. But alas, when the facts change, uh, you have to change your approach. And uh, the, the, the briefing that I had yesterday about this mutation uh, of the virus, particularly about the speed of, of transmission, uh, was not possible to uh, ignore. And when the, as I say, when the virus changes its method of attack, uh, we as a, as a country have to change our method of defense. And uh, that's what we're doing. Shall I take uh, the one that was addressed directly to me and then Sir Patrick may want to talk about Port and Dan. Um, I want to put some numbers out there because I think that helps to explain why I'm going to give the answer that I'm going to give. But my short answer would be, please unpack it at this stage. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is if you look uh, at the southeast, if you look at the east of England and look at London, there's been a, a really dramatic increase in the proportion of the cases that we see that are, when we do on the screening tests, which are not absolutely exact, but pretty accurate, uh, would imply that in the southeast, 43% of the virus is now this new variant. Uh, in the east of England, it's 59%, uh, and in London, 62%. The numbers may vary slightly, but those numbers are broadly right. And those have gone up very, very fast over the last few weeks. So this has really gone incredibly quickly. They are much lower in other areas of the country. 
And then when you look at the rates of increase in hospitalizations that have been, the numbers of people in hospital across the country, what you see is in the areas where this is very, very common, you're seeing rates of increase of maybe 36% in the east of England, 34% in uh, London, and 28% in the southeast. These are the areas which had actually have uh, significant uh, numbers of this new variant. But if you go to, let's say, the northwest and the northeast and Yorkshire, in these areas, there has been no increase in hospitalizations. They're, they're managing to keep things down with tier three. And if you look at the rates of this new variant in those areas, uh, you see uh, they're much lower. So for example, in Yorkshire and the Humber, uh, around 5%. Now again, the exact numbers don't matter. But the point is that if you have a lower amount, amount of this variant, the rate of increase is held by the tiers. If you have a very high rate of this variant, then it is not held sufficiently by the tiers and it is going up rapidly. And our big worry is essentially this is growing in two directions. It's growing up in terms of the percentage where it is. So it's getting a higher and higher proportion of the cases. And as Sir Patrick said, the chance if someone gets infected of them having to go to hospital or dying at the end of it seem to be roughly the same, as far as we can see so far, uh, as the previous variant. Uh, and if they were to go with this new variant unwittingly to an area that has a low prevalence and start this being seeded even more outside the high prevalence areas, that would be a significant risk uh, to the area they went to. So that is the reason we are really keen that people do not go from these areas, because otherwise we'll not only see it going up in the areas that's already a problem, we'll see it going out to other areas of the country where it currently is not a problem. And that it was because we understood this information in the back end of this week uh, that we advised you really do have to act at this stage, because this is, this is otherwise every area of the country will get this very quickly, and then none of them will be able to hold things with uh, Tier 3 and Tier 2 elsewhere. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Laura. Robert Pesson, ITV. Just to answer the oh, sorry, down give me. question. Sorry, just to, to answer the Porton Down question. Um, Porton Down are looking at this all the time. Um, when data become available, we'll make sure we get it out as soon as we can, but we don't have any more information than we've shared today. Thanks very much, Laura. Let's uh, go to Robert Pesson, ITV. Um, your colleague on SAGE, John Edmonds, has just sent me a statement saying that as far as he's concerned, this is the worst moment of the epidemic because of the extraordinary inf infectivity of this new strain. Do you agree with Professor Edmonds? Um, we saw the virus rising in Kent during the lockdown and during tier three. Why didn't you take evasive action then? to close down Kent, even before you knew that there was a new strain? And what confidence do you have that the new tier four measures will suppress the virus, given that the lockdown did not suppress it in Kent? Well, can, perhaps I could just give a, a layman's answer, uh, uh, Robert, because I think the, the whole point is that we were, we were very puzzled during uh, the, the November the 5th to December the 3rd uh, autumn measures by why the tier three uh, system wasn't delivering the results in uh, in Kent that it was delivering and, and uh, a couple of other places that it was delivering uh, for instance in the in the northwest and the, and uh, clearly there was something going on it's not really I think it'd be fair to say until uh, yesterday as we've seen this data on transmissibility uh, that we've really got the uh, the answer that uh, uh, explains it and Today's action is a is a is a, a response to that that change in the science. That's my that's my my, my layman's answer. Yeah, I mean, look, is it the worst moment? Well, I'm afraid there have been so many terrible moments in this epidemic. This is another one, but I I have to say that my, in my own view, this is not the worst moment in the epidemic, and the reason for that is although this virus is more transmissible, and we must do everything we can, which is what the prime minister has announced, to keep it as constrained as possible, keep it down as much as possible, so it does not spread. We do have medical countermeasures. We have a vaccine already being rolled out, as the Prime Minister said, uh, and therefore there is a prospect relatively in the, the sort of medium uh, term future where things could be quite a lot better. And if you think back to the, uh, the dark days at the end of March and April, not only were the numbers going up incredibly fast, mortality was actually higher than now because medic medical treatment has got better, but we had no uh, vaccines on the horizon. They were in the far horizon. So I think this is a situation which is going to make things a lot worse. 
there are some there are some really optimistic things if you look once we get the vaccine out, assuming that the vaccine works against this, which I think at the moment is our working assumption. And that is, you know, we really must hold the line. And my view, and Patrick will want to add to this, is what we must absolutely do is slow this down absolutely as much as possible. And the, the, if we can take it down from a doubling time of every seven days, which it is in many areas, which is really fast, if you think about that compounding up, and pull it right out, even if we don't manage to pull it all the way down, and we hope we will, at least then we're not going to have this skyrocketing number, we're not going to have the numbers spreading out across the country, and that will give us a chance to get the vaccine out uh, and protect the most vulnerable people so that if it does then escape, what we have is the barrier of the vaccine to help uh, protect them. But that, so I think you know, this is a bad moment. That's the reason the decisions have been taken by the Prime Minister and, and uh, ministers, uh, but uh, the, there is at least this prospect uh, in the future. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, this is a horrible moment, for sure. Um, I think we should, though, thank that we've got the uh, genetic sequencing consortium that's actually got onto this very fast and found an explanation of what was going on. I think that's really important that we've got that and will continue to utilise that resource in the UK. And we know what needs to happen to try and slow this down, and it's the basic things. I mean, although this is complicated in many ways, in other ways it's really simple reduce contacts, do the basics, face, hand, space, make sure that that is what we do to try and resist the ability of the virus to spread from one person to another, and it will slow it down. And, and, and that's what we need to make sure we get on top of, as Chris said. I think this will slow it down, and we need to make sure we keep a lid on this. It's not a good moment for sure, but it's one that's controllable. And as Chris said, there is an important light at the end of the tunnel with vaccination having started. Thanks very much both, uh, and, and thanks, Robert. Let's go to Sam Coates of Sky News. Prime Minister, this decision will be upsetting for millions of people, so could you just speak directly to everyone suddenly now spending Christmas Day alone? What, he what hope can you give them? And similarly, what's your message to people considering gambling and breaking the rules? And finally, how long realistically do you think everyone will have to stay in Tier 4? Is there any chance it's in place until enough people have had a vaccine? And to the two scientists, is the new strain impervious to social distancing measures? Might the two metre rule and existing face coverings no longer be enough to protect people? Would you travel in a train carriage through Kent tonight? Well, um, thanks very much, uh, Sam. Obviously, the, the, these measures, as I say, will be reviewed uh, like all the others every, uh, every two weeks. Uh, and uh, there'll be a, a, a chance for, for Parliament to consider them, obviously, as long with all the other tiering questions it, uh, at the end of at the end of January obviously people should not uh, break the rules uh, obviously people should follow the the guidance uh, I hope very much that uh, elderly or, lo or lonely people who are able to form uh, bubbles who have household bubbles will be uh, will be uh, have that consolation uh, that's that's clear from what we've said uh, today uh, but I suppose what I would say to everybody who's uh, now thinking of having a much reduced uh, Christmas. I, I, of course, uh, we bitterly regret that this is necessary this year. I know how much love and care and thought goes into preparations for, for Christmas. I suppose the message is, you know, that this is the year to lift a glass to, to those who aren't there in the knowledge that it's, you know, it's precisely because they aren't there to celebrate Christmas with you this year that uh, we all have a better chance that they'll be there next year to celebrate Christmas with you. I suppose that would be my, my message, Sam, uh, to the country. Um, in terms of the, uh, the social distancing, yes, social distancing does work. It doesn't work as a, as a yes, no. The more things you do, the more, de more de determinedly you do them, the more people do the basics for themselves, all the things Patrick talked about, the hands, face, space things, but also break unnecessary household links the more this and every other respiratory virus goes down. And just to give some ex other examples, for example, flu rates are down, adenovirus rates are down, because they also have exactly the same effect on other respiratory viruses. We do not think that the current measures will not work against this, but we're going to have to do a lot more, more in a sense, to stand still. It's like you were cycling up a, a steep hill and now you've got the wind against you as well. You just have to do that much more to actually keep going. And that's really what we're going to have to do. But the actual tools themselves, unfortunately, remain the same tools.
And would I go through uh, Kent? Not unless it was absolutely necessary, not because I don't love Kent, Kent is fantastic, but because this is not the moment with this virus circulating to have unnecessary travel. Uh, so only if there was a very good reason. Thanks very much, uh, Sam. Let's go to Chris Hope of the Daily Telegraph. Chris, you need to un unmute, I think. We can see you. Can you hear me, Prime Minister? Yes, got me? you. Forgive me for that. Um, how will this be police, Prime Minister? Do you think the police should be stopping people from travelling outside of the Tier 4? And do you advise the police to knock on the door of households that break these rules on Christmas Day? And are these an admission that the tiers have failed? Are we back to essentially lockdown until March? And just for the scientists and, and, and medics, I wonder why Britain has got this one so bad, this variant so bad. Which other countries have it? And how did the new variant get here, please? Well, Chris, first of all, I think the police have done an amazing job of, of uh, enforcement, light touch enforcement. They've uh, handed out lots of, uh, of FPNs, fifth penalty notices for breaches of the, of the rules, but they've also uh, helped to keep people overwhelmingly uh, in line with what they need to do. And that's, you know, I, I really thank the police, uh, men and women up and down the country for what, uh, for what they're doing. I'm sure they'll continue to do it in the same way. Uh, throughout this period, but I'm, th I'm sure, above all, I think people will naturally uh, want to uh, do it themselves, as they've done throughout this uh, throughout this crisis. The bulk of the population uh, take this incredibly seriously, uh, get it right, um, and, and uh, they'll continue to do so. In terms of the, the question about why here and, and, and where else is it, uh, viruses mutate all the time, so lots and lots of mutations of the virus around the world. This one is a particular constellation of changes which we think is important. Um, I think they'll arise for every time a virus replicates, it can make a mistake. And so that some of these things just arise by chance. The question is what advantage it gives the virus. And this one seems to have given the advantage of transmissibility. Um, we think it may be in other countries as well. Um, we think it probably is based mainly we think there's a large outbreak in the uk it may have started here we don't know for sure um, there will be other types of mutations around the world it's very important that this sequencing effort to try and find out what the sequence is doing how much has changed look is looked at at a global level and we start to get a handle on where these changes are occurring in the virus across the world it's going to be an important part of surveillance going forward brill thank you nigel nelson sunday mirror uh, one for the Prime Minister. Um, given you were at least aware that there was a, a new variant of the virus out there as far back as November, do you now feel it was reckless to promise five days of Christmas against scientific advice? And if I may ask Chris Whitty a question, earlier in the week you were talking about keeping uh, meetings uh, at Christmas time short without specifying what short was. Can you say now for tiers one, two, and three, whether that should be seeing Granny for a cup of tea for an hour, a two-hour Christmas lunch, or four hours going to sleep over the telly? Well, no, no, Nigel. First of all, thank you very much. But uh, we've always taken account of scientific advice, always uh, tried to follow it, and uh, that is what we're doing today because the, the science is clearly uh, changing and has changed uh, in the sense that our understanding of this uh, new virus, its transmissibility, uh, has been radically shifted uh, just in the last 24 hours, uh, or, uh, and uh, certainly the, the understanding of, uh, of the people before you uh, here this afternoon. And uh, we, we simply can't ignore that. And that's why we're, we're taking these extra steps today to protect the country. In answer to the question you, you put to me, um, I mean, what, what I said, and I have, I, I'm very happy to repeat it, is to the extent you possibly can, keep it small, keep it short, keep it local, and remember the vulnerable are vulnerable. And that is still absolutely the message. So if you've got your grandmother, you really want to minimise the amount of contact. You want to keep it at a distance. Uh, you do want to have the shortest period you can, because what you really want is to get to the point when... Uh, your grandmother has been vaccinated, ideally when you and people around you have been vaccinated, taking the risk right down. At that point, we have, we're in a different place. But at this point in time, at this really, really 
critical and dangerous time uh, pre-vaccine but high uh, transmission. Uh, I, I, I would repeat it, keep it small, keep it short, keep it local uh, and remember the vulnerable. And short should mean as short as you can manage with a reasonable social interaction. And, and I think one way to think about it is assume you could be infectious. I mean, it, it's not somebody else's issue, it's your own issue. You might be infectious, and that's the way that we have to behave at this moment. Assume you might be infectious. Yes, it can't be stressed too often that uh, you, a lot of the transmission, of the, of the uh, infection, is uh, by people who don't have symptoms at the time. And I don't think people who have, have still now fully get that in, in the way that perhaps they, they need to. It's absolutely vital, I think, to, I think one in three... Uh, in, is, is, uh, infections are, are transmitted asymptomatically uh, still, and, and people really need to, to realise that. Can we go to uh, Anna Mikhailova of the Mail on Sunday? Prime Minister, you said earlier that when the facts change, you have to change your approach. But the facts three days ago were you knew about the new strain and you knew that infections were rising. And still you said it was too late to cancel Christmas. How do you expect people to follow the rules when they keep changing? And secondly, another question for you, Prime Minister, have you put, are you going to put any additional support in place for businesses and shops that are having to close now? Thanks, uh, Anna. Well, for, uh, on the, uh, just on the, on the, uh, the, the facts of the, uh, of the science, uh, I think we've tried to, to spell out this afternoon uh, what has changed. And what has changed is the, uh, the velocity of transmission, our understanding of how fast this disease is, is, is transmitted and uh, the susceptibility of, of people to getting it. Uh, as I say, NervTag uh, thinks it's up to 70% uh, more transmissible now than uh, the old variant. We simply can't ignore that. Uh, that's data that's been in our possession now for uh, a day or so. We have to act to protect the, the public. And obviously, Anna, we will do everything that we uh, can, as usual, uh, to look after business, to look after jobs and livelihoods throughout the, the pandemic. Uh, and we'll continue to do that with uh, the, the loan scheme, with, the, with furloughing, which uh, the Chancellor has now extended uh, right the way through to, uh, to the end of April. Uh, we'll continue to, to look after your businesses that are forced to, to close as, as a result of uh, what's, what, alas, uh, is, is happening. Uh, they will receive uh, the, uh, the protections uh, that uh, we have put in place, the loans, uh, the grants that we've put in, we've put in place, and we'll continue uh, with all that. But I want to stress that this is a, uh, this is still a, uh, this is a race, and uh, we still are uh, doing our absolute level best to protect the, the public, uh, whilst we know that the vaccine is arriving. And I'm very, very confident, more confident than, than ever, uh, that we'll get that vaccine into uh, a significant proportion of the population uh, by the spring and that things will be radically different uh, for our country uh, by Easter. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And, and although uh, this is unquestionably uh, a, a difficult moment in the campaign against, uh, against this, this virus, in the struggle against this virus, uh, those fundamental facts, that fundamental reason for optimism about the progress that we have made, uh, that remains unchanged. Thank you all very much. Thank you.